Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good morning, everyone. Nice to hear, or nice to see so many folks that are joining us this morning. If you'll give us a few more minutes, we'll allow a few more folks to show up, and um, we're close on time. We're gonna, we are gonna start pretty close on time. So let's just give it just another minute, and we'll be ready to rock and roll. Our subject, as everyone knows today, is the road to ISO 45001 conformance, compliance. Just we're going to talk about some practical and easy steps. I personally am very excited about this standard. Um, I am hoping, I am encouraging as many people as possible. Please require your suppliers to conform to ISO 45001 require them to get certified to ISO 45001. Um, I believe it is a tremendous move in a direction where we can help the workers of the world be in a much more safe environment where companies um, are expecting a third party to come in and be looking at them. I believe that this is a tremendous opportunity for us as professionals to affect the world that so many workers live in. So we're gonna get started here. Um, as we go, This let me just tell you, first of all, what we are going to cover. We're going to first talk a minute about what ISO 45001 doesn't require. Then of course, we're gonna get into what it does require and we're going to look at designing a suitable system. And emphasizing what ISO 45000 does not require. When we implemented 14,000, ISO 14001, which was the environmental management standard, it was oftentimes implemented by quality professionals who had always required a manual in place. That is, it was not a requirement of the standard, but so many people set up a manual when they were doing a environmental management system or a health and safety management system. There is not a manual required. There is not any documented procedures required by the standard. The focus of 45001, which is the health and safety standard and the environmental management system is to let the process tell you what documents are necessary. And this will be this will be, be explained as we go through. But if you will, in your implementation, if you will do it with the methods that I'm talking about, then the methods themselves will tell you what documents are required. So what does it require? It is similar to what we have been seeing in our, our new quality management standard. It requires us to determine the context of the organization. The good news is if you are either, if you are already certified to 14,001 um, or any of the other standards, 9,001, any of the security standards, all of the new standards require you to determine the context of the organization. You only have to do it once. You don't have to do it for each standard. What you do once can apply to all of the standards. Determining of the context of the organization requires us to look at the external and internal issues that are affecting our ability to achieve the intended outcomes and also the needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties including those that could become legal requirements. The method that I use when I'm doing consulting is I create a table of issues. 
So my issues are in one column and their ability to affect is in the next column. I then create a table of interested parties and their needs and expectations. There's not a requirement in the standard that I document these two, uh, two items, but there is a requirement in management review that you review these on a periodic, uh, during management review. If you don't have them documented, I think it would be very difficult. So I choose to document them. The next step is to determine your scope. If you already have a scope for a management system, it may be that you've already got that scope defined. A scope's definition is the boundaries of the system. I use as a common definition, it's where the crime scene would go. And if you put tape around the crime scene, as we've seen on so many movies, um, you would know that that's the boundary of the crime scene. Well, if you in imaginary put crime scene tape around your organization, define what that scope would be by determining what those boundaries are. The scope is a description of what you do. Do you design and manufacture? Do you design, manufacture, and service? Do you design, manufacture, service, and install? Or do you just provide a service? The scope typically will begin with one of these words. Step three is to determine the processes of the occupational health and safety management system. There are 10 processes that I believe need to be talked about in some way in your OHS management system. If you would like a copy of this list, it is available on my website, www.ce-q.com on the free documents page. Uh, you have to enter your email to access these documents, but this is just a list of the processes that you would need to know that you have implemented in order to set up this management system. So once you you know what your processes are, now we've got to begin our, our efforts to get our leaders and our workers to participate in creation of the system. This is very important. It's the only standard that I know of that requires you to have evidence that the workers are participating in the creation of this system. The standard is very clear on the management team having responsibility and accountability for the, the prevention of work-related injuries and ill health. Our management team is responsible for, for providing a safe and healthy workplace for all activities. The standard also is requiring that we make sure that our health and safety be part of a strategic direction of the company. Now think about what that means. In real life, I should be able to see some type of evidence that the management team is watching the numbers, watching the information that is coming from the health and safety system. I should be able to see in their goals and objectives how that the requirements of the health and safety system has been rolled into the business processes. Again, this is a shall, so this will be something that your third party auditors will be looking for. Step four, just continuing, I'm emphasizing some of the things that it says that that leadership team must do for the, um, the management system. They must provide the resources. They must communicate importance of the effective system. They must ensure that objectives are achieved. They are going to direct and support persons to contribute to the effectiveness of the system. 
and ensure and promote continual improvement. So think of what a third party auditor might ask you. They might turn to some of the people in your organization and say to them, give me examples of how the top management team supported your efforts in having a health and safety management system. Continuing on leadership and worker participation, as we all know, the culture of an organization truly influences the outcomes of the health and safety management system. And leadership is expected to set that culture. They set that culture by not only their actions, but the words of their mouth. And we really have expectations for the culture to be set. That is a requirement of the management system. They are also expected to lead continual improvement to ensure that the legal requirements are fulfilled and that the objectives that are set are met. Uh, you'll be able to find in 5.1M, it actually states that there is a requirement for top management to establish health and safety committees. This is a very prescriptive wording in this new standard. You must have safety committees actively participating in examining your organization and looking for things that must be improved. Step five of implementing an occupational health and safety system. Leaders and workers will set the policy. It must be established by top management because it is their ultimate responsibility. It does need to be a commitment to eliminate hazards and to reduce risk and to continually improve at this. It is required documented information. It must be somewhere in documented words that we can see as third party auditors. By the way, I am a third party auditor of um, occupational health and safety management systems and have been auditing them several years. So trying to, um, I, this has a lean on what a third party auditor would see and would expect. Step number six, we not only have to make sure that our top management is involved, but we must ensure the participation of workers. It's not just in safety committees. We must ensure that the workers participate in um, setting the organization, setting up the culture for the organization to have a, a, a safe environment. Top management it is expected to make sure workers have the time to do this. They need training on how to participate and how to bring things about. And any other resources that those workers need are, need, are going to be expected to be provided. As a third party auditor, guaranteed, <laughs> I will be talking to the members of that safety committee to find out what kinds of issues they have with time, training, and resources. There's also some more specifics in 5.4.D that of what must workers must participate in, and it's a laundry list of things. Here's the 15 things you can see that they are going, they must be part of participating in determining the needs and expectations of interested parties. Uh, working on the policy, part of assigning roles, responsibilities, and authorities, determining how to fulfill legal requirements. As you can see, the workers that are chosen to be in your safety committees will be expected to uh, get into some management thinking and methods. So now you can see why that training of those workers who are going to participate needs to be um, very centered on helping them to develop the management skills they will need to perform these activities. They are expected to establish, be part of establishing the audit program. They're expected to be in part of uh, determining what the hazards are and reducing those hazards. 
determining what training needs there are for everyone, determining how to communicate. They should be part of determining how we're going to mitigate our hazards. And last, but one of the most important things, and this was part of the previous standard, they must be part of investigating any incidents that occur. Step number seven is determining the risk, opportunities, hazards, legal requirements, and controls. I've rolled a lot into step seven uh, to create what I call the risk, opportunity, and legal table. If you will look at this table, um, it tells you that, first of all, you're going to list the process. You're going to list the activities in that process. You're going to list the risk and opportunities as part of that activity, any hazards in that activity, the controls needed for that activity, who is responsible for that control, if there's anything that needs to be monitored or measured about that control, and if there are any legal requirements. How, what are they so that you can make sure that you're also meeting those in your control? Again, this table is available at ce-q.com on the free documents page. The risk, the opportunities, the legal requirements are all required documented information. Remember the one of the part of the pot title of this webinar is making implementation practical and simple. This table is the key to making your system practical and simple. It's how it's the first other than our scope, our policy and our objectives. This is really the first document of our occupational health and safety management system. This is not a requirement of the standard to set it up this way, but my job today is to tell you how to do an implementation practically and simply. And to do that, this is what you have, what I recommend you do. Step number eight is to set objectives and plan to achieve. Your objectives need to be based on the table that you just created. So you're going to look at your hazards. You're going to think about which ones are the, have them, should have the most priority in being addressed first. And you're going to set objectives to continually improve that um, health and safety risk, to prevent that risk from becoming reality. Notice that objectives should not be something that are, are carved in stone. They should be very flexible, they should be dynamic, and they might only be there for the immediate future. It might be the objectives for this quarter, it could be the objectives for the year, um, it, they have a time limit on them, and th therefore they would then be, uh, other objectives would be set. The standard is prescriptive. It does say for every objective that we have, we must know what will be done, what resources are needed, who is responsible, when will it be complete, how the results will be evaluated, and how is it integrated into the business processes. So for every objective you have, the standard has a requirement that you must have um, the answers to all of these questions about the, the objective. The standard doesn't require you to put it into a table, but this is my recommendation for you to put it into a table. In that table of risk and opportunities and the legal, if you will look at your, when you create that table, it tells you the controls. The control could be a competency that's needed. 
I'm going to go back just to a couple of slides and remind you. Uh, I think you can see my pointer. Remember, we talked about the process, the activity, the risk and the opportunities, the hazards, and from that, we determined what we're going to use as controls. Examples of controls might be that you need to make sure that people have certain competencies. Here in America, um, here in the United States, when someone has to has hazardous materials, there are certain competence, competencies that are expected for anyone who is involved in handling of those hazardous materials. So the point I'm making here is those controls on that table will tell you the competencies you need. They will tell you the awareness you need, any communication that you will need most both internally and externally. The table will tell you if you need documented information. In other words, if one of your controls to ensure that um, all of the machines have guards on them, then you might have a checklist, documented information that you use monthly to review all of the machines in your area to ensure that all guards are in place. The corollary of this comment is that if you do not need, if a doc, if there is not, if the control does not say that you need documented information, then why do you have it? return of that would be the opposite of that would be that if you have a document and it's not and it, it's part of your health and safety management system but you don't have it listed in your health and safety table your table of uh, risk and opportunities then you've missed a control that you already had in place i i know that we can't have an exchange of information here, but I'm hoping someone will ask a question about this and make sure that you get this. The documented information that you need will be outlined in that table. If it doesn't, if your table, when you're finished with your table, doesn't say you need a document, then you don't need it unless it's required by the standard. Okay. And all of the controls, they're very, uh, the standard is very generic and does not have any specific controls for what you would use. The controls will also tell you what must be practiced for emergency preparedness and response. Here in the United States, we have a, uh, a law that says that we have to have fire drills and tornado drills and hurricane drills if they're appropriate for your area. So our legal requirements would also tell us what controls that we need. Those controls, we would also know what we need for contractors and for outsourcing. I'm gonna go back two slides, look at this table again, see how the controls are going to tell you what you need to do in the system. This is a very important concept when you're going to have a practical and a simple system. Okay, as you're talking about controls, if you are trying to plan a control, the standard gives us a hierarchy of controls for eliminating hazards and reducing OHS risk. The very first thing that you want to do if you do have a hazard is if you possibly can eliminate that hazard eliminate it eliminate the need for it if you cannot eliminate the hazard substitute with a less hazardous process a less pro hazardous operation material or equipment 
For example, you might have a chemical in your organization that is very uh, toxic. First thing that you want to try to do is eliminate that toxic chemical. Get it out of your facility. Stop buying it. It's not used anymore. If you can find a less hazardous chemical that can do the job. A third step in the hierarchy of controls is to use in engineering controls or to reorganize work. For example, you may have to have a hole in your floor um, that allows access to the floor below. The hole, it has to be there, we can't eliminate it. So you then a good solution would be to put up barriers around the hole to prevent um, an accident from occurring. An example of an engineering control you could make as top management, you could make a policy that um, no one can work alone in an area. They have to have a buddy with them if they're performing work in a hazardous area. An administrative control would include things like training, um, safety equipment inspections. Remember I mentioned about doing an inspection to see if all the guards are in place. That's an administrative control to ensure that an engineering control is in place. Lastly, you would provide adequate personal protective equipment. So the standard expects us to take this approach in trying to address the controls for the hazards. We're on step number nine, which is management of change. The way to have an effective management of change process is know what triggers the change. If you can determine in your organization what is going to trigger a change, that's how you would determine that the management of change process begins. As with all of our processes, first, the first thing you have to do then is know the inputs. You then determine the task that must be performed, which could be, uh, approvals from different types of managers uh, to ensure that that change is managed. It is a planned change. We have thought about risk during our management of change. We have, uh, we have uh, put in controls to eliminate or uh, reduce, mitigate the possibility of problems from the changes that we're going to make. Ensure when you do have a management of change process that it considers the hazards, the legal requirements, and their task to make the change, and to ensure that the outputs of the change are controlled. Remember that all of the standards, all of the new standards, require having a management of change process. You don't have to have several different management of change processes. Combine these into one process. Step number 10, evaluate the compliance to legal requirements requirement, the legal requirements. So you've talked about your hazards. Now you can go into your um, laws of your country, the laws of your state, the laws of your local and say, does this hazard have any legal requirements associated with it? That's what, how you determine what the legal requirements are. Then you are going to evaluate the compliance to these legal requirements. This is part of the management of the system. It is like the internal audit of those legal requirements. As with every standard, you're going to have some type of internal audit program, some type of management review, and some type of corrective action that's going to drive our continual improvement. Ideally, you would have an integrated system so that when you do your internal audits, you would look for any compliance to legal requirements as well as any 
requirements for quality, for environmental, whatever is part of your process audit. The process audit would be all encompassing. I think this also is going to mean that we're going to need more, tr more training, more help with our internal auditors to help them to have more management skills. Just a comment on incident nonconformity and corrective action. Remember that it requires worker participation. Um, it also requires that you reassess your table of risk opportunities and legal requirements after each incident. Please note that if you have had a corrective action system that was conforming to the previous standard. This is a word of warning for anyone who still has not updated, upgraded to the 2015 standard. There are more requirements with the corrective action process than there were previously. I have people say to me, oh, I have an 8D corrective action process. Great. You still are going to have some new, some other actions that need to be um, implemented as a required of the requirement of the new standard. So make sure that you edit your corrective action system to include the new requirements that are in the new standards. Here's just a summary of our 10 steps. The first thing we talked about was to determine the context, which was our issues and interested parties, determine the scope, determine and plan the processes of the oh &S management system, require leader and worker participation, get your safety committee going, set the policy, ensure con consult consultation and participation of workers in the system. You're then ready to determine your risk opportunities, hazards, legal requirements, and controls. You can then now set your objectives and create a plan to achieve those objectives. You can then create a method and manage change and create methods to manage the health and safety management system. As we're finishing this course, I want to remind you that there are many PECB training courses that we have available to you. Uh, we have a, <laughs> you've just gone through 30 minutes of an introduction to uh, 45,001. Can you imagine what we'll get into in a full one day course? We also have foundation courses that are available. These are ideal for helping train your um, workers that need to participate in the system. We can do those for you on site, as well as um, we have public courses available for you. If you want to become a third party auditor, or if you are the administrator of the 45001 system, then you probably want to attend our five-day course. It will be a very good investment for you to attend that course. If you were, are planning to work for a certification body, you will need the lead auditor course. And then we also have a transition course. Please, as you are um, preparing for your 45,001 implementation, Make sure that your people get the training they need, and PECB is an excellent source of that training. I want to thank you for participating, and Arden, Arden, if you want to, I would like to turn it over to you, and we'll go through questions. Um, we've got some time, and I am hoping that we have um, got quite a few opportunities to answer your questions. Yes, Deborah. Uh, thank you for this very insightful and great presentation. And also thank you for introducing PECB training and certification services. 
As you mentioned, a PCB certificate will exemplify your dedication in implementing and managing ISO 45001 process and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Now, we'll go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions from the attendees uh, regarding today's session. Uh, the first question is uh, how the focus of ISO 45001 is different than OSAS 18001, uh, especially for construction industry? Um, worker participation, I think. Yes, it had some emphasis in 18,001, but nothing like it has in 45,001. That's to me is the, the major difference. Um, construction, of course, is one of our most hazardous industries. So um, your table is going to be quite intense and um, the management of ensuring that those controls are going to also be um, a big focus for construction organization yes uh, now the second question is uh, please touch upon how to successful uh, successfully implement clause 5.4 uh, worker consultation uh, which looks like a challenge <laughs> it is going to be a challenge because we are going that worker we're going to take him off the line or out of his normal work um, which we needed him to be doing. We've got customer demands, and that's going to be a very big challenge. So that's why the standard is emphasizing that one of the measures of a top leader's commitment is them being willing to provide the time and pay someone else to do that worker's work while he is participating in a management function. Um, you are, that's a very good point. It is going to be very challenging. 45,001 is going to be expensive for you to implement. But let's all think about the value of one person's life. Yes, it's going to cost us in implementation and maintaining our 45,001, but if it saves someone's life, we have invested in the future of our company. Next Thank question, Artie. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, next question is, how do you get your workers to be involved in setting policy and ensure uh, they are consulted when sometimes these workers are part-timers or foreign workers. To say that what, they're foreign workers, is that what they said? Yeah, yeah, foreign workers or part-time workers. How do you get uh, them to be involved in setting the policy? You're going to have to get them in a room. Um, first of all, you've got to do some training up front, I believe. Um, if, if you don't do some training up front with these people, they're going to oftentimes be so intimidated by being in a conference room, having to interact with a management team until I think you're going to have to choose very wisely which workers um, you love to participate as far as part timers. The standard doesn't say that just because they're part time, you don't have to have them participate. It is, you're going to have to. Um, if you've got foreign workers, again, choose wisely. Um, ideally, they would be able to speak the same language as the management group, but if not, you're going to have to have interpreters available. And anytime you start working with interpreters, remember that almost doubles the time that you need to get work done. So um, it's it's going to be a challenge, this worker participation. I agree. It is going to be a, a huge challenge for us, but it is a requirement of this standard. Thank you, Deborah. Now the next question is, 
Will there be a big difference in the implementation of ISO 45001 in a facility with a labor union versus a facility without a labor union? I think it might even be easier in a labor union. Um, it's an interesting concept, and, and I, I'm going to base this on the union shops I've been in. Union shops already have representatives elected, and um, they're used to managing different aspects of the relationship between labor and management. So those workers are oftentimes more skilled, um, the ones that are elected in, to participate at, and lead the union. So you may actually have an advantage there. They're used to having input. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Uh, next question is, do you need to describe the type of product or service provided in the scope? Yes, yes. Um, you're going to say we design, manufacture, service, and install what kind of widgets, okay? If it's a service organization, you're going to say providing the services for um, patients, um, dermatology patients. So yes, the scope is still the same type of scope. It's just, I was emphasizing the point that it would it should begin with one of those types of verbs. Thank you, Deborah. Now to conclude the, the presentation, uh, can you please uh, touch upon the implementation of Clause 8.1.1, uh, the operational controls, a little bit? Well, the first thing is if you've built your table, you're going to have a list of controls that you are planning to have or either you have in place. So you've got to have, once you get your table built, then you will be able to know what work you've still got to be to do and as usual we would have to prioritize which controls have the greatest impact on the health and safety of our workers and decide which ones we're going to implement first great uh thank you deborah uh, once again for this great informative session and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar I would like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website as well as on our YouTube channel together with the slides of the presentation. If you want to get more information, you can visit our website www.pcb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.